Hi, Nicole. Welcome back. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Oh my God. I feel like this is going to be one of those things that we're just going to keep bringing you in to talk more and more about taxes. And as people get more and more acquainted with the idea that they can talk about it and hear about it, then maybe they'll start using it as like a series and then probably go to your podcast and listen to more. And then everybody's going to be better at their taxes. And then the world is feeling better. And then we all don't have issues about taxes. I mean, is that like, I think that's the bottom line, right? Was that the whole spiral? I love that. (laughs) I love that as a vision. (laughs) I think we nailed it. Um, But for anybody who does not know you, who has not listened to your two other episodes that we have had on this podcast, um, talking all about taxes for artists and breaking down important documents and how to make money and all these things. If they have not listened to those episodes, who are you today? Yeah. So, well, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a, originally a painter. I'm still a painter. Just took down a solo show. Um, but I'm also the founder of Sunlight Tax. So I'm a tax professional. And really my mission is to give great empathetic tax information to creative people who are self-employed, as most creative people are, um, because it sucked for me (laughs) when I was starting out my career as a professional artist. I felt completely unseen and unvalued by accountants and just had a hard time accessing uh, the information, which is, you know, it's hard enough already to understand how to pay your quarterly taxes or, you know, set up some basic bookkeeping or understand what self-employment tax is. Um, but then to have the person who's intent, you know, charging you money to give you help, like not even recognize the fact that you're a legitimate professional, it's, mm-hmm. uh, that's what I want to correct in the yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> so helpful thus far for us in our community, but again, for you and, um, your podcast community and other artists that you serve. Um, I, I guess I don't want to be redundant in terms of the things that we've already covered in our prior episodes, but at the same time, I want to make sure that we are like doing like a little quick up to speed so that we can talk about what I think we really want to cover today, which is really talking about like 1099s, which we didn't, we haven't really spoken much about as that deadline approaches. Mm -hmm. So let's just double back like a hair in terms of the cycle that we're in, in the, I guess it's like the annual quarterly breakdown of the things and how we've gotten to this point of 1099s being on the docket at this current juncture or what that even means. And then we can really delve into like, what are they? How are they? What do we do? Where do we, where do we do them? Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, just as a baseline, most creative people, not every single one, um, but most creative people work for themselves, right? So Mm -hmm. as a baseline, most of you listening are likely self-employed. When you're self-employed, you're basically seen as a business under the U.S. tax code, um, even though you haven't done anything like, quote, official. So that's kind of the the place to start. Um, there's a couple key things to understand there. One is that as a self-employed person, you have to pay self-employment tax. That's like one of the things that people typically underestimate when they work for themselves, basically because we have no tax education in this country. (laughs) Like it's not actually unfair when you look at the law, it like really is scrupulously equal in its treatment Mm -hmm. um, of people who are employees versus self-employed, but we don't get taught how it works, right? Right. So self-employment tax is basically you paying both the employee and the employer side because you are actually both, and there is no other option, um, of Medicare and Social Security. So self-employment taxes, you paying into just that system, and you haven't even touched your income taxes yet when you're paying self-employment tax. And this is the reason that our taxes feel especially high. And people are like, wait, shit, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, how did I owe this much? So that's like kind of the base. Um, And then from there, it's also important to understand the other side of that coin, which starts to get us into, you know, doing your taxes as a self-employed person is that you are given the privilege of taking almost every expense of running your business with a couple exceptions, but mostly everything you spend on running your business operations, whether you're a voice actor or a lighting designer or whatever you're doing, you get to deduct them. You do not pay tax on them. They are tax uh, tax incentivized under our tax code. So it's awesome. It's an awesome deal. And that is the only thing that reduces your self-employment tax and your income tax. So it's really worth it, like getting every Mm -hmm. single deduction. I definitely do have some resources for people that I can link to in the show notes. Like I have a visual guide um, 
to to your tax deductions. I have one specifically for performers because I know performers mm-hmm. often end up having a lot of questions specifically around like appearance stuff, yeah. you know, um, personal gym membership. Makeup. Haircuts, and, makeup yeah, exactly. Yeah. Clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and the IRS does get a little fussy. <laughs> And yeah. which of those is and is not deductible. Well, it's such an interesting shift just like noting when I started my career to now of, you know, like not that that back in the day was like the right way. It was just kind of this like thing that we were taught that we were supposed to dress up in some way a little bit more or m- maybe geared towards more of the thing and like in and in inspiring the visual of the thing versus now it's just like how are you showing up more as like yourself and amplifying that and then the role is like through you and maybe like suggesting it hair but it's not like I'm going to wear a dress to all my auditions like it's not at that and because of that hmm. it's like how do you justify that I'm getting a really cool pair of jeans that really makes me feel in my body in a way that allows me to then bring this character to life it's like very hard to justify that on a piece of paper because you can't write to the IRS that like you needed to play this part and that's why you need to wear the jeans that you also wanted to wear to a date. <laughs> like, a little Yeah. Strange. Yeah. That's a, I mean, a, the short answer here is like, it's not great news on those jeans. Yeah, <laughs> but- I know. And that's the hard part because you really want those jeans and you also know that you can get them as multi-usage jeans to just put everywhere oh, and do them with everything. Oh, I know. It's like, it's like when a, um, when a painter says to me, and I, I, I hate having to be the bad guy in this, but yeah. like when a painter says, but I'm inspired by everything. I'm like, yeah, that is not going to fly with the IRS. I know. Be in your body, love your jeans. Uh, be inspired by everything. Just you don't deduct everything. <laughs> don't deduct everything. Well, okay. So, I mean, I also just want to flag as we always do in our conversations that money taxes, Um, things with finance, you know, makes all of us feel something on a spectrum of emotions. Some of us feel a lot more secure and stable in it. And some of us feel the complete opposite of that. And so just naming Mm -hmm. the fact that as we navigate through this conversation to take care of yourself, however that might need to be. Um, and also that, um, you know, we are all coming from a different perspective and place um, when it comes to entering into this conversation. So I just want to like name that into the into the room again, as we always do for these conversations. Totally. Um, and if, if I could just add to that for a second, please. Like, there is no tax education in this country. And mm-hmm. a lot of us, especially if we are, you know, grew up in the arts um, outside of the well-resourced STEM fields, where you know we assume that they all know what they're doing because um, they got the resources, and we assume that we are broken because right. we don't know what a solo four hundred one k is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not true. <laughs> First of all, the STEM people don't know taxes nearly as well as you might think they do because nobody does, um, and so it's it's not you. It really, is our system. Yeah. And so I just want to release everybody from the guilt or the shame you might be feeling because of your lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's far more of a baseline than you probably recognize. Um, I can say this because I do the taxes of tons of people, usually people who don't have a financial education like I didn't originally. Um, But it's, it's, you know, it's really shocking. Even, you know, even the one guy in the back of the room who stands up and needs to prove to everybody how much he knows, you know, by asking mm-hmm. a question that feels sophisticated on taxes. You know, <laughs> I'm not trying to really make fun of that person, but we all know that person. Yeah, We've 100%. seen that person in an audience. And um, even that person will like have, will misstate things even in the question, right? Like, so nobody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody. yeah. No, I it's mean, that's like- why we keep bringing you back because I think even just the basic foundational stuff, even if we think we know, we might not really know and we don't, and mm-hmm. it's embarrassing or it feels embarrassing to, or it feels like there's shame around being like, well, I should know this as you're saying, like yeah. I should know this. And therefore I can't admit to whoever that I don't know this. And then I don't feel like I can ask somebody and and then now I'm struggling and then and now I'm alone. <laughs> like, and then it totally. becomes a little spiral. So. And I, I've just, I've just identified this thing that it's, it's been there for a long time, but I think I finally put words to it partly because I'm in the middle of writing a book proposal. So I like literally yeah. had to put words to it. But I think this thing is, especially when we're in a field where we're fighting for respect, you know, as professionals, mm-hmm. um, or we've had to really bust our butts in order to kind of be seen as the professional and the expert that we truly are. 
I think when you're in that position, it can feel especially um, shame invoking to Mm -hmm. then have to come to a situation where you really know nothing or your baseline is so, so shaky, right? You're like, I don't know the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA. You know what? No one does out of the womb. It's a thing you have to learn, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so Which, by the way, like we have talked about in our last episode. So go to that episode and, and listen to it because <laughs> we do talk about what that is. So yes, carry on. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I think especially when you have have really cultivated an expertise and you feel that feeling of the world does not respect what I do. I need to prove that I'm a professional it can really be hard to come from that stance into the total vulnerability of being like, okay, like I don't understand what self-employment tax is. And trust me, nobody does. So it's okay. That's a completely legitimate question. So, yeah. So then let's ask it. What exactly is self-employment tax? Yeah. So self-employment tax, if you were, if you were an employee um, and this is this is good because talking about 1099s, kind of getting clear on employee versus contractor is a good distinction to make right yeah. up out the gate. So if you're an employee, um, you the IRS, if you think of how you would design a tax system, if you were designing one, right, you would not just be like, go ahead and earn all your income for the year. And, you know, at the end of a whole year after you've earned all this money, we'll just send you a bill. For what you owe. And we'll just we'll just let you at one shot just pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Cool. Right? Yeah. Like, how do you think tax collection would go under that system? Not well. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. the IRS just mm-hmm. doesn't let it happen. Right. So if you're an employee and you are paid on payroll, which is pretty much mandatory if you are an employee, then they say to your employer, there's no there's no option here. We're gonna have you take out that this employee's Medicare and Social Security. So they never get it in their bank account in the first place. It just, they earn it and it's going straight into their Medicare and Social Security accounts. They don't feel the pain ever because it's just already there, Mm -hmm. right? So as an employee, you pay 7.65% of your pay into Medicare and Social Security. That's your money. Mm -hmm. Um, The boss, this is the part you don't see, your boss is also paying a mirror image amount. They're actually matching your contribution exactly, except you will never see this show up on your pay stub or in your W-2 because it's not coming out of your pocket. Your boss yeah. is actually paying out of their pocket, and that's mandatory. So that whole second half of it, you never see. And a lot of mm-hmm. people never think about it for that reason. Yeah. So the thing is when you are self and, – and the thing is that number is always correct because it's the same number for every employee, 7.65% of what you earn and then your employer matches it, right? So this is a knowable number and it's always being paid accurately already. Then on top of that, you have withholding going to pay into your income tax, which that one you do notice because you have to actually fill out a little paperwork to indicate what kind of withholding you want, basically like – And that paperwork is the – W-4. There we go. And just a mnemonic device for you, the even numbers go together. If you fill out a W-4, that's connecting to the W-2. W-2 means you're an employee. Um, So does a W-4. So you fill out a W-4. The W-2 is your reporting statement, your year-end reporting statement for your employment. Your W-4 is the paperwork you fill out to show your boss what kind of withholding they need to take out of your W-2, take out of your paychecks. Perfect. So um, that W-4, you have a right when you're an employee, you can fill out a new W-4 at any time and update your withholding and change it. So it's Mm -hmm. not fixed and it's all based on you. And the reason is your employer does not know what your tax rate is. Because your tax rate isn't just based on your pay at that job, unlike Medicare and Social Security, which are. So this is the reason you fill out a W-4 because, you know, you could be married to, a, um, you know, the top neurosurgeon in L.A. And that person might be making half a million dollars per year, which would put you guys in the top tax bracket. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also could be making nothing but that W-2 income and have six dependents and no other income, and you could be in the bottom tax bracket, right? Your employer doesn't know, and you don't have to tell them. You just have to fill out this paperwork that says in a kind of slightly disguised way, I want a lot of withholding, I want a medium amount of withholding, or I want a very little amount of withholding. And what would the benefit of any of those be? Like if I were to withhold a lot 
off the top versus if I were to withhold nothing off the top, what happens mm-hmm. to me and what are the benefits of yeah. either? Well, so in a perfect world, you want to get that as close to what you actually are going to owe in taxes as possible. Obviously, people get this wrong, right? And not just because we don't know things, but because life changes every day. And you might you might get an enormous bonus, right? Um, or you might, for example, your acting career might start taking off and you might get paid for a role and you get an enormous chunk of money that you hadn't anticipated, right? So that could mm-hmm. skyrocket your tax bracket. You could have filled out your W-4 perfectly accurately at the time, forgotten to fill out a new one. And that would mean your withholding was way too low and you would end up with a tax bill. You would owe the Got difference it. that you hadn't prepaid. So that's what mm-hmm. happens if you underpay. If you overpay, you get a refund. Nobody really complains too much about that, except that it's often nicer to have that money every month of the year instead of getting it sent back to you by the IRS who's been holding on to it. Um, Yeah. So you kind of, yes, you want to over withhold maybe because you want a refund. And in a world where people have trouble saving, that can be Mm -hmm. an enforcement mechanism on savings. And a lot of people use it that way, not necessarily intentionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but they rely on their tax refund as like their big chunk of money for the year. Yeah. Um, so you can kind of, you, you get the total discretion to decide how much withholding you want, although you have to have some, basically. Got it. And so yeah. the counter now is like, we have the self-employment situation where you don't have the employer and you're the employee and both are paying into this thing. And that's mm-hmm. where the 1099 comes into play. Um, sort of. So when you are self-employed, it's possible that you make your income through 1099 income. Um, mm-hmm. if someone else is paying you, that's often, it will get reported to you on a 1099. So you're considered, you're called by somebody else, a 1099 person sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but 1099s go both ways. Of course, if you pay people, then you are Uh, paying contractors, and you also have to issue them 1099s. The way that the taxes work when you're self-employed, just to complete the loop here, is that there is no withholding either of self-employment tax, so Medicare or Social Security, or of income tax. No withholding at all. So you get paid money and nothing is taken out. And the reason, and the thing is that they they cannot automate any withholding of money because you're the only one who knows what your deductions are. Those are coming out of your bank account. You have to be the one to do the bookkeeping because there is no other person (laughs) who's spending that money. So it does mean you have to be tracking deductions. You have to have the sort of running tally of what your income is, what your deductions are, and therefore what your profit is. These are the three layers. Um, and knowing what your profit is, that's the key to knowing how much self-employment tax you owe and how much income tax you owe. And just to put the final bow on it, you have to pay your taxes every quarter. You're not allowed to wait till the end of the year, till tax day, to pay it all in one chunk. That's actually not legal. You will be charged daily interest for doing that. You, you don't want to do that. And it's also how you fall behind on your taxes, which again, is not fun. Um, so quarterly taxes, they feel sort of horrifying, I think, when you first learn about them, but actually they're your friend because they keep you out of tax debt. They yeah. keep you ahead of your tax bill. Okay. So knowing that we have these quarterly taxes that are supposed to keep us in checks, so that we don't fall behind, we don't get it, have interest put on top of us, it, does, it makes our lives in essence easier for something we have to be doing. Mm-hmm. Let's say I don't have the budget for an accountant, or let's say I've chosen to decide to keep my taxes on my as my own project to do for myself. How do I know when these are? Who is keeping me informed of what is actually <laughs> due? When? How do I, on the back end, stay organized to make sure that I'm paying those things and have it accordingly? Like, how does that all the system of that function? Assuming I don't have another human being who I'm paying to help me through it. Yeah. Um, So most of us kind of enter into this system totally blind, and most of us never learn about it until we're already behind on our taxes, unfortunately, because our taxes are retroactive and there's no tax education. I sound like a broken record. No, but but it's real. (laughs) It's very real. It is real. So one thing you can do, first of all, is just stick the deadlines in your calendar and put them on repeat. So the deadline, the the quarterly tax deadlines don't change. Um, they are April 15th. So April 15th, please note, 
is tax day. Yes. So it's the day that all your taxes for the last year need to get settled up. Um, there's no extensions on the payment. They are due April 15th. Um, but it's also the dead, the deadline for your first estimated quarterly tax payment. So that's for the new, co- the, the year that's you're in the middle of, as opposed to your tax bill for the last year, like the tax return you've just done, which is retroactive and which is for last year. So, so you're doing both simultaneously on that date. You're doing, you're correct. closing out your prior year and you're mm-hmm. beginning your estimate for your next quarter of that current year you are in. Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So that's April 15th. That's the first one. The second one is June 15th. Please note, that's only two months apart. So that one really sneaks up on people. And that's because you get a four-month first quarter. Uh, So yes, these are not even. (laughs) There's reasons that I could get into them if you want. But April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, January 15th. Those are the deadlines. First quarter, second, third, fourth. And to clarify which the dates are referring to, the April 15th, are, is that referring to the January up through that 15th or is it referring to the April 15th up into June 15th? Ah, yes. So they are retroactive, even though you're doing them for the current year. So that first one, the first quarter, um, April 15th, when you're paying your first quarter, you're paying it for the current year, the year that's on the mm-hmm. current calendar. So you're paying last year's taxes. So if we're talking about April 15th, 2024, coming up mm-hmm. in a couple months, on that date will be due whatever you still owe, hopefully nothing from tax mm-hmm. year 2023, because you're doing 2023 taxes right now. That's It's 2023 tax season because taxes are retroactive. We wait till mm-hmm. you know what happened, right? Mm-hmm. Um And then your first quarter is going to be January 1st through March 31st. And so basically what you want to do is have some level of bookkeeping. It doesn't mean you need crazy complicated software, but you need some basic tracking on a spreadsheet is fine of this is the income I made between January 1st and March 31st. These are the expenses I had between January 1st and March 31st. And if you just think that through, if you just do the subtraction, of the expenses out of that income, you come to what your profit was for that quarter. And that's what you make a calculation on for what you owe in taxes. You're going to owe 15.3% of that for sure um, towards self-employment tax. And then you'll owe some degree of income tax on that as well. The income tax rates range from marginal rates range from zero to 37%. Average rates tend to be a lot lower than that. So your average rate is probably very likely between 10 and 22%. That's the sort of center of the bell curve. Obviously, I cannot guarantee that for anyone. (laughs) You have to check for yourself. Um, But a good baseline is to just look at last year's tax return um, and go off the average um, tax rate that you paid last year. Um, As long as you're you haven't had a dramatic change in income, that's going to be as close as you can get to making an as- accurate guesstimate for this year. And you, it's really important to remember they're called estimated quarterly taxes. You are not tasked with getting the number completely mm-hmm. right. It is normal to be a little off, and it's o- totally yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. This is very helpful. So we are simultaneously on April 15th, for example, doing, again, if we're talking about 2024, April 15th of this coming year, we're looking back retroactively and finalizing everything from 2023. And then the first Mm -hmm. January 1st through March 31st of 2024. And then again, I would imagine the June 15th one is from April and May. And then it goes from June to the end of August and then Mm -hmm. September through uh, January. Got it. Okay. Beautiful. So- Is there a is there a website that we go to to check um, where brackets lie? Is there something that we can look towards when we're like, hey, I've done my income and I've I have my income in estimated income and I've taken my deductions or my expenses from that and now I see my profit. Where mm-hmm. am I? How do I know where I fall? How do I know what I'm guesstimating is what I'm paying? Do we where do we look for that? Yes. So. This is, it can be a little bit tricky. I'm not going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, There are, you are, you have to make an estimate because you don't know how, what your income tax rate is until next year. 
This is right. the nature of quarterly taxes. And this is why people are so weirded out by them. First, you come at it without having any education. Right. Often you come at it without having ever done it before and having no guidance. And it's very easy to be in a real what the fuck kind of a zone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, that's a technical term, obviously. A hundred percent. Yeah, we all use it. <laughs> um, so... It is really tricky, and I just want everybody to give themselves a little grace here. They are called estimates on purpose. Um, Self-employment tax is the easiest thing to estimate because you actually do know that number. It's 15.3% of your profit. So that one you can take care of pretty easily. Your income tax rate, you're not going to know for another year or a little less than a year. So you really, your best move is really to base it on your rate last year. Okay. Or to go look up, and you can just do a little Google search here for um, like income tax rate calculator. I found a good one at the AARP <laughs> okay. of all places. You can put in, you really want to make sure, it's very important that when you're using an online income tax rate calculator, one, I highly recommend you do not use one from a tax prep company. That is somewhere that is trying to sell you something and they Mm -hmm. don't really want to give you a very accurate answer because what they want to do is give you enough of an answer that you feel that they're helpful, but not so much that you actually know the answer. So they Mm -hmm. want you to come in and pay for tax prep, right? So don't, don't use one of them. (laughs) The AARP, I I liked them because they, they don't have skin in this game, right? Yeah. So they have a good one. Make sure you click that you put self-employment income. You want to make sure you categorize your income correctly because not calculating that self-employment tax is going to way underestimate your tax and you really want to be accurate. The goal is to be accurate. Um, Don't accidentally call it employee income because you'll be radically underestimating because that will assume that, you know, as is the law for all employees, that you've had all this stuff withheld and you have not, Mm -hmm. my friend. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to share with you, Jennifer, um, like in the show yeah. notes, I have a link on my YouTube channel, the Sunlight Tax um, YouTube channel. I have a little video. It's about like seven or eight minutes. And it just, it shows me literally making my tax payment, my quarterly tax payment right. on the IRS website. And I, with my Love it. social security blacked out. And um, Good. <laughs> so you can navigate the little drop down menu and just see like, this is, this is the one you pick for est- making an estimated payment. Right. Great. I love that. Yes, please. We'll put that in the show notes. Okay. So now we have the framework of how the year is going to work. Now let's go back to the 1099s. What exactly now is a 1099? Yeah, sure. So a 1099 is a reporting statement. It's a, um, Mm -hmm. basically it's a record of what you got paid or what you paid someone, right? It can go in two directions. You might issue 1099s to people you paid and you may receive 1099s when you got paid. Um, and there's actually multiple kinds of 1099s. They have like little letter abbreviations at the end. So there's 1099 INT, which reports interest income. There's 1099, oh, let me see. There's a million of them. There's a 1099 K, which comes from a third party payment processor. That's one of our newer 1099s. Um, and then the one that most of you will see all the time is called the 1099 NEC. And the NEC stands for non-employee compensation. So Mm -hmm. contract work, basically. So that's what a 1099 is. And the whole goal, like from the IRS, the whole kind of purpose of a 1099 is to make sure that all income that is received in this country is reported and taxed correctly, right? Um, In the absence of 1099s in a total cash economy, people would uh, potentially not report their income and not pay taxes on it. And the IRS Mm -hmm. is not really cool with that. (laughs) So, Surprise. um, (laughs) Bummer. Real bummer for all of us. (laughs) Shocker. Um, Yeah. So they are very, very interested in making sure that um, everybody who, you know, made income has that income reported. And so it's really important to understand that this is an area of growing scrutiny and the penalties get stiffer every single year. So the crackdown is uh, underway. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's not good to assume like, oh, I never had to do this before. I I managed it. Nobody ever came after me when I didn't do this last year or the year before. Do not rely on that. That is not safe. Um, mm-hmm. because they're very, they haven't, 
think the name for it is Operation Buried Treasure, but it is the IRS Unreported Cash Income Program. Believe me, they're on this. (laughs) In my brain, that sounds like, I'm sorry if anybody's listening, uh, works for like, you know, the traffic state police that like sits on the highway and, you know, I'm coming for your, I'm going to belittle your job for a second, but it feels like that kind of job for me where you sit buried in trees on the side of a highway (laughs) and your sole purpose of your job is to ruin my day as I'm speeding down the highway and that as you come and find me, all you tell me is that now I have a ticket and I have to pay a lot and now I go home and cry. And then they repeat the cycle over and over again. And truly there's something a little bit awful about that being your job is truly to just ruin other people's days is how I view it. In my brain hearing you say operation buried, did you say treasure? Buried treasure. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like that to me. Well, not reporting cash income is actually criminal behavior. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I realize I, I sound speeding on the highway, you know, like I shouldn't <laughs> so always speeding on the highway. And we enforce this, you know, to, you know, keep standards and norms in our in our yeah. society. It, it is but you like, know, why are you they, look I mean, the that's act- like a that's a name. That is a choice. You're that's right. a real operation. It's not a public name generally. <laughs> but- <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. You know, they need a little excitement at the IRS. Maybe probably. it's that. Yeah. Little pirates. That's okay. Fine. You know what? Let's reframe it. These are maybe fun this little allows jobs. We're everyone at the adventure. IRS to speak in pirate voices and they really, yeah. really need that. You know what? Yes. You know what? This is great. Now we all are wearing costumes and everyone is happy. Okay. So now that they're going to come after you, don't do this. The 1099 is a two-way street. And so in this quarter right now, this is the 1099 quarter. It's less than a quarter. It's just a month. You have a month. Um, so 1099s are due. If you paid anyone in the prior year, then you need to issue them a 1099 by January 31st. Um, the reason that you need to do it by January 31st and not by April 15th is because people need to receive their 1099 in order to do their taxes. They cannot do their taxes until they get your 1099. So that's why the deadline is January and not, you know, March. Um, mm-hmm. And so if you paid anybody over $600 in the prior year, and that's cumulative. So if you paid them twice, $400, you've crossed the threshold. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you have to issue them a 1099 to just say, you know, this is what I paid you. That's it. It's it's very simple. It's not a complex um, piece of paperwork. It's really just meant to make visible what, you know, in the past, there's been a little more possibility for having be invisible. Um, Got so it. that's all. Yeah. And so these 1099s, again, are retroactive for 2023 in this particular situation that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's for everything you paid in the year prior. You mm-hmm. issue them by January 31st. And then all of these contractors of yours, or if you are a contractor of others, you need to either get them back to those people or they need to get them back to you mm-hmm. way before your April 15th deadline so that you can process all their stuff accordingly and your stuff accordingly? Yep, that's exactly right. So if you, a good practice for anyone, whether you only received 1099 income or, you know, contract income or whether you paid it out as well, a good practice would be to go through your books for the prior year. Like January is a really good month to to go through your numbers from 2023 and tally them up. Like, see what you made, see what your profit was for the year. That's going to be something you need to do your taxes anyway. Um, There's no waste in this. Um, But also to get that list of people who you paid. You know, maybe you paid for headshots. Maybe you paid a product photographer. Maybe you paid uh, somebody, I don't know, to to put a lighting situation in your little Instagram corner. (laughs) I'm pointing to mine over there. Um, (laughs) Any of those people, if you paid them for your business, you know, over $600, you're going to owe them a 1099. There are some exceptions, but what you want to do is basically create a list, the sort of big list of who you might owe a 1099 to. Then you can check the fine-grained rules and see if maybe a couple of them don't actually need to get a 1099 because they are, for example, an S corporation. So 
um, nobody here has to know what an S corporation is, but what you need to know is that if somebody is an S corporation or a C corporation, you don't have to give them a 1099. Basically, Hmm. this is really only for sort of smaller scale businesses. And if you think about the purpose of a 1099, it is to make visible um, payments to small scale businesses. So the big ones are regulated more with heavier scrutiny anyway. So they're not going to miss stuff, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in in an S corp, which is why we don't need to bother issuing. And this doesn't apply to LLCs. This just applies to S corps and C corps. LLC is irrelevant when it comes to taxes. That's the funky part. You're, okay. The word LLC is almost like we shouldn't even use it in a tax conversation because it's sort of like, well, what else are you? It's a legal entity, but it actually is not an entity that has any bearing on your taxes. So what um, happens with the EIN number? Like when would that be applicable in when you're filling out, you know, your different forms and you choose to at the top, oh, yeah. you know, click your little LLC and your EIN? Like what is that actually affecting? Yeah. So the EIN, um, basically when you form an, if you decide you're going to go form an LLC, um, you know, talk to a lawyer, that's a legal thing, not a tax thing. But when you form an LLC, essentially what you do is you create a legal separation between you, the individual and you, the business. So what you're paying for is a barrier in between personal and business. P.S. There, you can invalidate your LLC with bad accounting or bad bookkeeping, you definitely, everyone is well advised to have a separate business bank account. But if you have an LLC, you absolutely critically need one because if you don't, your LLC can be deemed invalid um, and not give you any of the protection you think you're paying for. You are paying for, (laughs) but not have it. So so an LLC, um, when you file the paperwork for an LLC, oh my gosh, P.S. There's a brand new L- law that applies to LLCs. I might, I'm just going to book not bookmark that for a second, but I have a podcast episode on it. Okay. Um, it's called New Rules for LLCs, okay. um, the Corporate Transparency Love. Act. Just a little bit of paperwork, but you got to do it <laughs> is the short answer. Okay. Oh, so boy. when you when you form an LLC, you file it with your Secretary of State in the state that you're going to be doing business in. And essentially the sort of technical thing that happens behind the scenes is you pick a name and you don't, you could be Jennifer Apple LLC. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you could be Sunlight Tax and which I am Mm -hmm. um, my LLC. And what you do is you're connecting the social security number for Hannah Cole with the EIN now newly obtained for Sunlight Tax. And so Mm -hmm. the secretary of state of the state of North Carolina, which is where my LLC is based, connects has the connection between those two things. It's a public database. Anybody can look up Sunlight Tax and they can see my EIN. Like that's public. Social security number, not public. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you fill out your Schedule C, so that's like the part of your tax return where you put your small business income, your contractor, sole proprietor income, in the corner, if you have an EIN, you put that at the upper right-hand corner of your Schedule C. But the only reason that's there is basically uh, the IRS already knows your social security number. Your social security number is already on your tax return. And these things are completely linked to the IRS. That's Mm -hmm. visible to them. So So when I receive like a 10, uh, like a W-9 from uh, a contract Mm -hmm. and I fill it out with my LLC and my EIN instead of my social how is that affecting taxes differently for the person who has issued me the W-9? It doesn't change anything in your taxes. It Got it. it. Yeah, it doesn't change anything. Um, your EIN is going to go at the top of your Schedule C. They're going to issue it to you. It does not make any difference. So why would one do it that way versus just fill it out with your social? Just because you want to hide your social? You're actually not supposed to use your EIN unless you have an S corp or a C corp. So you're actually supposed to use your social security number unless you have a corporate entity. Um, Interesting. So, so why do they give that option of the LLC at the top? <laughs> if you're not supposed to do it. I actually think you could not make a more confusing form than the W-9. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like I don't, I don't. <laughs> and also like what, can we just talk about what a W-9 is? Yeah. The W-9 is sort of analogous to the W-4 related 
being related to the W-2. And here the nines go together. So the W-9 is the paperwork you fill out if somebody's going to issue you a 1099. So right. you're, if you fill out, somebody puts a W-9 in front of you, you are being hired as a contractor. Somebody puts a W-4 in front of you, you are being hired as an employee. So you can know the, the paperwork tells you the answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the W-9, um, the role of it really is just to give that person who's going to pay you the info that they would need to issue you a 1099. And uh, I want everyone to take note because that's what we should do. You know, if you're going to pay somebody, you should give them a W-9 and you should not give them payment until they give you back a W-9 because you need that paperwork. Um, Because what I see in my tax practice is that people will, you know, in January, they get headshots and then that person like goes out of business or moves to China and you cannot find them again. And now you're accidentally breaking the law because you can't locate them and you don't Mm -hmm. know their social security number and you have to issue a 1099, but you can't find them. So So are you saying that even pre the contract going out, get the W-9 before, say, in this situation with the headshot photographer, get the W-9 to them immediately, do your whole session, and then deal with the ramifications or otherwise down the line come January 31st. Yeah, just, I mean, ramifications, it's a a positive one. Positive, yeah. Yeah. Get a W-9 from everybody you're going to pay. um, Even preemptively, like once you start your relationship with them, start it with the W-9 and then move through. Well, take Love notes that. from any organization you've worked with, right? So when we're mm-hmm. when we're operating as individuals and there's fuzziness and people don't know the rules, we don't necessarily always know to do this. If you yeah. go, you know, do a gig with a large organization, they're not paying you until you give them your W-9. You know this. Correct. You've had this happen right. to you. Yes. <laughs> you should do the same to people you pay because you actually yeah. need that document. You need that piece of Love paper. that. Love that. Yeah. Okay. What else about the 1099 have I not asked you that I don't even know to ask that is important (laughs) come this January 31st deadline in regards to receiving, giving, filing, bookkeeping, getting ahead of? Like, What else do I need to ask that I do not even know to ask? Yeah. So basically, it doesn't need to be a huge deal. You just need to do some bookkeeping so that you know who you paid and you know what amount you paid them. I do mm-hmm. think that there's some a little like check that you can do before you go issue a 1099 to somebody is double check their address, make sure their address is correct. Um, it's truly awful to miss a 1099 because you moved in the middle of the year and this happens, yeah. right? People move. Mm-hmm. Um, when you issue a 1099 to somebody, you send one copy to them and one copy to the IRS. That is the process. So if that person, you know, it's nice. It's really a, it's not mandatory, but it's a nice thing to check in, be like, Hey, Jennifer, do you still live at, you know, 67 Oak street? Um, it's really nice to do that in advance of sending that because if you moved, the IRS is getting their copy, but you miss your copy. So what happens? You're going to get an automated letter from the IRS saying, whoopsie, you got paid this money and we didn't see the tax. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't want those letters. I mean, mm-hmm. they're resolvable and they're very common, but it's annoying. Yeah. So. What about when when you use the word issuing? Are we talking about I just get to email it to you? Am I talking about and then you fill it out? Am I talking about it needs to be a physical form? I know I've received them in various forms. I'm curious if there's mm-hmm. like more protocol to it when we issue it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, – I mean, it's an official tax document. You can get a blank one off the IRS website. You can do it that way. I don't really recommend filling them out by hand. It's not great. I use a service called um, Track 1099. And that is, I think they charge maybe two or three bucks per 1099 to issue. But to me, that is well worth the money. Um, Track 1099 will even do an electronic W-9 for you and that you can receive like securely. And, you know, it's a social security number. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have people email you their social security number. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's nice. They will do like an encrypted W-9 if you, you know, if you didn't send them out and you need them, you know, in January. Um, So that's a really nice service. I like it a lot. It's what I recommend, what I use myself. Um, But you can use a service like that um, and I usually think it's a good idea too. They're generally pretty cheap. Um, and just Beautiful. fill out the paperwork and what the paperwork mean, like, you know, log on to track 1099 and you just, you're going to fill out, you know, 
Jennifer Apple and your social security number and your address. And that's pretty much it. You know, there's a couple check boxes, right. backup withholding, things you don't generally have to worry about. Yeah. Great. I'm curious also about like the organization um, for just preemptively setting up um, oneself for success when it comes to like documents coming in, how we stay organized in all yeah. of that. Yes. I love this. So January is the time, right? This is when the last year has closed out. So now it's the time where we, it's the gathering time of the numbers. Uh, harvest your numbers. <laughs> yeah, harvest your numbers, hibernate in your, in your cave and just, just sit with all the yes. things and hope for the best. Great. <laughs> it's definitely when you want to kind of do, get your bookkeeping as organized and in shape as you can, because you're going to need all those numbers first and foremost. First for your January 15th final fourth quarter estimated quarterly tax payment. Second for your 1099s, which are due January 31st with interest accruing daily every day you're late after that. Um, and then third for the actual filing of your tax return. So it's really nice to get that done. The other thing is you just want like a physical location um, to put your tax documents. That is like one thing you can do to be organized in January that is easy, but will help you. So think about it. You're going to get some physical documents and some electronic documents. You just want to designate a spot. Um, this is not rocket science. You just need like this drawer in my desk. This is where my tax documents go. And you know, when you get that envelope in the mail slot that says tax document enclosed, mm -hmm. you don't even have to open it. You just shove it in that drawer. Honestly, it's a little better to look at it in case it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes you get a 1099 that has a zero, an extra zero on it. You don't want to pay 10 times the tax. You didn't really make yeah. that money. <laughs> you yeah, need to get a corrected truly. one issued. So it is a good idea to actually look at them for that reason because you can go back to the person and say, I need you to issue me a corrected 1099. You misstated what you paid me or my records show you paid me this, not this. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a thing. But, but basically, assuming those documents are correct, you just have a drawer that you stick them in, a file folder, whatever it is. And remember, if you're married and you file a joint tax return, maybe everybody's stuff goes in the one drawer or maybe each spouse has their own drawer. You know, mm -hmm. that's up to you all. But that's maybe there's two two to tango yeah. in this situation. And then electronically, like more and more, we're getting our tax documents. You know, you can consent to get your W-2 or your 1099s electronically. So you also want to just create, you know, in your Google, um, in your inbox, just create a little folder that's for tax documents 2023 and just, just file them into that so that when you're ready, when you've got them all, you can go into that folder and, you know, whether it is print them out or send screenshots to your accountant or would it, however you're do, choosing mm -hmm. to do your taxes, that you have it all in one place. Got it. Yeah. yeah. I think that feels doable. It feels solvable. It doesn't feel overwhelming. I know when it comes to, you know, we've had, we've, in our two other talks, I've talked about my... <laughs> Re resistance towards the organization part of it or how, you know, the difficulty of that when, you know, I'm so the other side of the brain and the creative side of it and the organization mm -hmm. is where, you know, I struggle with it. Um, and so yeah. I think, yeah, th throwing stuff in like little folders and then dealing with it when it's pertinent and throwing stuff into a, a drawer and dealing with it when it's pertinent, obviously checking it and then dealing with it when it's pertinent, but like, you know, doing, having it in spaces that feels a little bit more at least tangible, if you know where to grab it when you are needing it, which is mm -hmm. going to be at these increments that you know are coming, which I mm -hmm. think is really helpful. Yeah. So that's really yeah. Good. I yeah. also want to make a distinction because I think not knowing the difference between these things can really set people up for some misery. So mm -hmm. it's really important to know that your receipts and your tax documents are two little bit separate things. So as you, you know, now that the calendar has switched over to 2024, you also want to update any files for receipts. So you now want a 2024 receipt place. And so again, mm -hmm. this, you get receipts both physically and digitally. Um, I just have like right behind me, right here, um, a mm -hmm. file folder, and I just create a new file for each year, each tax year. So I have 2024 tax receipts, and I just literally dump them in that folder. I do not sort receipts. I do not recommend anyone sort receipts ever. Just 
put the first, put the one you just got in the front. And when your wallet gets too full and you want to empty it, put all the receipts in the front of your folder and magically all your receipts are sorted. You never have to touch there them. There you go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, as we begin to wind down our time, is there anything that I didn't ask that I would, I would behoove us to have on this particular episode? Yeah. Well, I think I think that's pretty good. I want everybody to check out the LLC podcast episode that I made about in mm -hmm. case you do have an LLC. Um, and I also have an episode about if you even need an LLC, because that is mm -hmm. such a big and confusing issue that it sort of doesn't really have a lot to do with your taxes, but people think it does. So I'm happy yeah. to drop those um, links for those episodes in your show notes. Beautiful. Um, and make sure that you do this little bit of paperwork if you do have an LLC or you form one in 2024 because there's this new law. It's a good law. It's actually meant to catch money laundering and human trafficking and financial crimes. Mm. But you got to do a little paperwork to remain on the side of the light. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think, oh, and the, the, last, the last thing I want to tell you is just um, mark your odometer. It's just like that's one little thing you can do at this time of year. It's just because business mileage is a big deal. Um, it's a huge deduction, bigger than people think, but you have to give a total of all the miles you drove for the year. And so at this time of year, if you mark your odometer, you've got an ending mileage for last year and you've got your beginning mileage for this year. So that's just one that. super quick little thing you can do to kind of keep yourself more organized. That's really, I wish that applied to subways. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just mark how many miles I've traveled to go in and out. Oh boy, that would have been that would be an incredible little added coup. Um, well, you can take part of your subway pass. I mean, like if you're going to sure. auditions or yeah, you can for sure. I just mean like in terms of being like how many miles have I traveled to do this and how have I gone to this gig and all of these. I mean, it's just you know it's a totally different, totally different thing. Um, but that's mm -hmm. a really cool, helpful tip for anybody who is. Um, driving themselves around. Um, I'm, again, as per usual, so grateful to you for just your breadth of knowledge and ability to truncate it in a way that that it can be in podcast form and digestible and also understandable for many of us who have resistance towards it. And also, as we talked about, you know, like just no education about any of it. And I even sense within myself, you know, having this as like our third time together. Like I, you know, I think the first time I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have a conversation about taxes and I, am I even prepared to have it? And am I even prepared to ask the questions? And now I'm like, okay, I know I'm in good hands and it's okay for me to ask something that may seem silly or it's, it's okay for me to ask a question that might feel, you know, self-explanatory and maybe isn't. And I already feel within myself how much more comfortable I'm getting, even just feeling empowered to ask questions around this with you, good. which is obviously a start, but also I would hope that that also means just expansively when it comes to my own bookkeeping and my own taxes. And so I just, mm -hmm. I want to keep affirming how helpful you are and how you are just such a beacon of resources for all of us. Um, and so for anybody who uh, wants to keep in touch with you, who wants to listen to your podcast, who wants to work with you, who wants to have access to all of these incredible resources, what are the places to look within your best boundaries? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I just really appreciate all of that, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, you can find almost every resource that I mentioned through my website at sunlighttax.com. Um, so that visual guide to your tax deductions, which is super nice. You can just print it out. It's one page. It's very beautiful. Um, that's at sunlighttax.com slash deductions guide. But if you forget the URL, just go to Sunlight Tax and you'll find it there. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, my podcast is at sunlighttax.com slash podcast, or you can just search Sunlight, which is the name of it on your podcast player. Um, and I will make sure to put some links to some of those episodes um, specifically that I referenced about LLCs Great. for you, Jennifer. Oh, and the YouTube link mm -hmm. um, because I do also have a YouTube channel. Um, my podcast is where I put all of my best content, but occasionally something is visual <laughs> and so yeah. it needs to go on YouTube. Yeah. So you can find videos there for things like the IRS drop down menu when you're paying your quarterly taxes. And also I'm going to plug your Instagram here, which is... Sunlight, it's at Sunlight Tax. 
Yeah, because you post some really awesome, helpful reels that are very time sensitive and pertinent for certain dates as they roll through. And um, you break things down in uh, really, again, digestible ways. Um, and so I, I just think you're an invaluable resource. And I'm so grateful that you continue coming back to this community um, and sharing your wisdom with us. And I anticipate that we'll probably have you back on again when I'm like, okay, there's more things that we don't understand. <laughs> this is just awesome. the beginning of a of, of beautiful, flourishing relationship where we just keep having Hannah Cole come back on and talking. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Bring me all those performer deductions questions. <laughs> done. Done. Sold. Thank you so, so, so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me again, Jennifer. It's been awesome. Yeah.